A man is strapped to a gurney in a room that's referred to as the hospital room of a prison, but it's really just a dingy basement where the warden watches over the torture of prisoners. That prisoner is hooked up to wires, each of them connected to a telephone. He's never seen such a contraption and has no idea what's about to happen to him. He takes a big gulp as one guard, barely concealing his laughter, shouts, Boss, is this going to be a local or a long distance call? The warden smirks and replies, Tokyo boys, I think we'll give Tokyo a call. The room is filled with a whizzing sound as a guard winds the crank of the telephone. The prisoner screams out in pain as electricity surges through his body. Since it's a long distance call, that's just the start of the punishment. The torture will leave the prisoner with irreversible organ damage, not to mention lifelong mental scars. We wouldn't blame you for thinking what we've just described never actually happened. It sounds like something from the Saw movie franchise, or maybe it's closer to something you saw in a Looney Tunes cartoon. It actually did happen, and when it was finally disclosed to the American public, one critic wrote that this form of punishment shocked the consciousness of the nation. Let's now get back to the start. The kind of telephone used for this torture was a crank telephone. This is how they work. In short, when a person manually turned the crank, an electrical generator was powered up. The mechanism produced somewhere between 50 and 100 volts, which would send a signal to a switchboard. The operator at the switchboard would usually hear a buzzing or a ringing sound, and the two people could be connected. It was a man named Dr. A. E. Rollins that decided one of those phones could be used to torture prisoners. In the 1960s, he was the resident physician at the Tucker State Prison Farm, Arkansas. That's why the torture device became known as the Tucker Telephone. Prisoners who were deemed impervious to all other punishments were the ones who were subjected to the telephone torture. Some of you might recall a prison movie from the 60s called Cool Hand Luke. Paul Newman's character was the unruly prisoner who just wouldn't follow the rules. The captain in the movie looked at that character and said the now historical line, What we got here is a failure to communicate some men you just can't reach. That movie wasn't too far away from reality. Men at the Tucker State Prison Farm were forced to work all day in the fields under the baking sun. If they became troublesome, they were tortured. Prisoners were routinely beaten. If they were killed, they were sometimes secretly buried in the prison grounds. This is a snippet from a Time Magazine article printed in 1968 regarding torture and murder in the state's prisons. The point was brought home painfully where three skeletons, one decapitated, one with its skull crushed and the third with its legs broken back, were unearthed from shallow, unmarked graves. The article said that for the truly intransigent prisoners, the Tucker telephone was used. Even though some men had nails forced under their fingernails and others were whipped with leather straps, it was the telephone that really put the fear of God in them. The article explained that a superintendent named James Bruton was the person that employed this particular form of punishment. A naked prisoner would be strapped down to a table in what would be called the hospital room, and then one wire would be wrapped around his big toe. The other wire would usually be attached to his genitals. When the crank was turned, an electrical current would pass through the prisoner's body. As for the long-distance and short-distance calls, this was a euphemistic language used by the officials as a kind of joke. The short distance meant one shock or possibly one or two shocks. A long-distance call was a series of shocks. The process was not only frightening and painful for the prisoner, but it was also dangerous. Repeated shocks at that voltage attacked the nervous system of the man, which could cause permanent damage to the organs. Repeated exposure to electric shocks can also lead to behavioral changes, such as the person becoming afflicted with depression or anxiety. The horrors that happened at the prison soon became known to people on the outside. This led to an investigation which detailed the brutality prisoners faced on a day-to-day -day basis. The Tucker telephone, though, was the thing that most shocked the public. Here's what a 1969 report said. In long-distance calls, several charges were inflicted, of a duration designed to stop just short of the inmates fainting. Sometimes the telephone operator's skill was defective and the sustained current not only caused the inmate to lose consciousness, but resulted in irreparable damage. Some men were literally driven out of their minds. The report stated that the telephone wasn't only used to inflict pain, but also used to extract information from prisoners. The prison tried to keep the use of the device under wraps, but investigators found one of the specially made phones hidden in a hat box inside a closet where Jim Bruton lived. This was referred to as the Big House. Reports stated that most of the prisoners were African Americans, but the horrors were inflicted on men of all colors. Bruton eventually faced charges for what he'd done. Charges that said he'd violated prisoners' civil rights by administering cruel and unusual punishment. He should have spent a year in prison and received a $1,000 fine, but Judge Mr. J. Smith Henley said that if he sent Bruton to prison, the outcome would be him being killed by other prisoners. 
For that reason, he suspended the sentence. This is what the judge said. The court doesn't want to give you a death sentence, and quite frankly, Mr. Bruton, the chances of you surviving that year would not be good. One or more of these persons or their friends with whom you've dealt in the past as inmates of the Arkansas Penitentiary would kill you. That same judge would eventually say that all prisons in the state were unconstitutional. Thomas O. Merton was hired to weed out corruption at the state's prison farms and address the brutality that happened there. He later talked about the massive profits being made at these prisons from slave labor, and he mentioned some of the tortures we have, adding some more that are too graphic to state here. He also discovered that men had been summarily executed and burned at Cummins' prison farm. He wrote in 1969, prisons, mental hospitals, and other institutions are a thermometer that measures the sickness of a larger society. The treatment society affords its outcasts reveals the way in which its members view one another and themselves. Many years earlier, the Russian novelist Fyodor Dostoevsky said this, the degree of civilization in a society can be judged by entering its prisons. Just after Merton started uncovering the atrocities at the Arkansas prisons, he was dismissed from his position. He'd just begun digging up bodies of men when he was told to stop by the governor. Merton later said he was blackballed by the corrections community for unearthing too many uncomfortable truths. He said a grand jury even thought about indicting him for grave robbing. It seems from then on, the Tucker telephone was no longer used in American prisons, but something very similar was used by U.S. soldiers during the Vietnam War. A book called Torture and Democracy by Darius M. Rajali shines a light on the torture employed. The author writes that using appliances on the battlefield, such as field telephones, to electrocute prisoners was hardly anything new. Many countries had done that over the years. You all know about cattle prods and taser guns. With the former delivering a shock of around 50,000 volts, the reason that shouldn't immediately kill someone is that the current isn't strong enough to damage the internal organs. They're supposed to stun a person, even though people have died from sudden cardiac arrest. According to Reuters, there were 48 such deaths in the US in 2018. As scientists will tell you, it's not the voltage that kills you, but how great the current is that surges through the body. That's why the Tucker telephone could cause such grievous physical and mental injuries. Unfortunately, we can't find any accounts of victims who survived the telephone torture in prison. Nonetheless, we saw reports that stated it was brought back in the 80s in Chicago. According to a number of resources, Lt. John Burge used it while he was commander of the Chicago Police Department. He headed a police outfit that became known as the Midnight Crew, a bunch of officers that were said to torture people to get confessions. News reports state that from 1972 to 1991, Burge either directly participated in or implicitly approved of the torture against 118 people that were in police custody. The reports state that the torture included burning and beating, but also electric shocks. It was heard in court that the men had been convicted solely on the confessions that had been coerced through prolonged torture. There is mention of cattle prods being used, but we can also find instances of when a victim of Burgess was electrocuted with something that looked like the Tucker telephone. One person was Andrew Wilson, who, with his brother Jackie, was found guilty of killing two Chicago police officers in 1982. Both brothers suffered injuries at the hands of cops, who burned and beat them and shoved pistols into their mouths as they demanded confessions. Andrew later sued the city, saying one of the things the cops used in its interrogation was a black box with a crank attached to it. He said police officers fastened wires to his body and a policeman turned the crank, which delivered painful electric shocks to his body. Reports state that Burge had served in Vietnam and the Mekong Delta in 1968. There, he could have come across a torture technique that some US troops called the Bell Telephone Hour. This technique was very close to the Tucker Telephone experience. In court, Burge said he'd never heard of such a thing and certainly never took part in such interrogations during his service in Vietnam. Investigations later revealed that some men in the 9th Infantry Division that Burge was assigned to denied they'd electrocuted prisoners, but others said outright that it happened all the time. Dennis Karstens was one of them. He said, We would pretty much do anything as long as we didn't leave scars on the people. He told journalists that field telephone interrogations worked well. He said they gave a pretty good jolt, kind of like if you've ever had an electric fence charge. Former Sergeant DJ Lewis agreed. He said they'd take a prisoner and strap them to a pole in a tent. In his own words, he said the men would rig up a field telephone and put one wire around a finger and the other around the scrotum and start cranking and they would eventually tell you what you wanted to know. When asked if he thought it was painful, he replied, Oh hell yes, it's painful. I mean, you can hold the two wires and barely crank it and get a jolt. The more you crank, the higher the voltage, and it's DC voltage, so that's more intense shock. Former Army Ranger Philip Wolliver said this about the pain. I know it's strong enough to where after a couple of jolts you can fake a crank because the victim would be looking right at you and the guy would go into convulsions. 
When Andrew Wilson first came out of police custody, he had marks on his ears as if alligator clips had been fastened to them. It doesn't take a great leap of imagination to arrive at the assumption that Burge took what he'd learned in the Army and used it during his reign of terror in the Chicago police force. Burge was fired in 1993. At that time, some attorneys in the city of Chicago believed Wilson's story about the electrocution torture. Some years later, former detective Melvin Duncan said this in court. While working at Area 2, I heard that certain robbery detectives used an electrical box and cattle prods on people to get confessions from them. Former officer Walter Young said he'd seen a device with a hand crank lying around during the time of Wilson's interrogation, but he said at the time he didn't really know what it was used for. He added that he heard people referring to the box as the Vietnamese treatment. Andrew Wilson fought for his innocence, but was convicted twice in the end. He died in prison in 2007. His brother Jackie, who was also tortured into making a confession, spent 36 years behind bars. He was declared innocent during his third trial and released in 2020. He has since filed a lawsuit against all those that did him wrong. He told the press, all I'm looking for is justice, all I've ever looked for is justice. This kind of torture likely happened to a lot more people. We'll finish with the words of a man named Leonard Hinton. He was one of the victims of electric shock torture during those dark days when Burge and his men acted like medieval inquisitors. He said he was taken down to a basement where the cops told him to strip. He had wires connected to sensitive parts of his body, which were connected to a black box. They put a cloth in his mouth and cranked up the machine, which Hinton described as causing out-of-this-world pain. As soon as one cop took the cloth out of his mouth, he cried out, I'm ready to talk. Tell me what you want me to say, sir. Please stop. Now, you need to watch illegal things that you do every day, or have a look at this.